I like when, when uh, Christians get together, different denominations, we don't just play nice. And what I mean is, I, I'm all in favor of being nice, you know, but I think there's more to it. There's the real engagement of issues. Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today I have a video again of Bishop Barron and in this video he is reflecting upon a, a dialogue and a conversation that he had with William Lane Craig. Now William Lane Craig is a Protestant evangelical apologist but there's lots of similarities in how they approach both Bishop Barron and William Lane Craig, really um, William Lane Craig and the Catholic tradition, how they approach apologetics, how they approach evangelizing those um, to convert or at least have a better understanding of what Christianity is. Now, this is the most important video I've ever made on this channel, and this is the reason why. I want this channel to be ecumenical. I want this channel to be able to go across the barriers that we have created in Christendom and to see that there is a great common ground and commonality as the church moves forward and there is a shared burden and there is a bond that is created in that shared, shared burden uh, between Catholics and Protestants on how we are going to evangelize. We are not going to dumb down the faith. We are not going to simplify things in the way that much of American society has dumbed down religion. There is a intellectual rigor and there is a very strong argumentation that both sides are using in different spheres and it's only propagating the church. It's only, it's only advancing the church. Now, I mention that because I have posted some other content by Protestant um, preachers or maybe from some dissenting views differing from Catholicism, and I've actually lost tons and tons of subscribers because of that. What I want you to see is if you're Catholic, you don't have to have this scared notion of, um, of a broader ecumenicalism, right? And the reason I say that is because Bishop Barron is in accordance and concords with that reality as well. We have to grow, go across the barriers that have been there since the 1600s, and we have to unite around the arguments, the, the intellectual rigor, um, the, 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 the great tradition that both sides, and, and, and if you're not aware of this, both sides believe in that. And it's even more so as Protestantism is coming up and changing and morphing just because of the fragmentation and how it's built and necessitates lots of rapid change. It's actually moving away from the simplified American evangelicalism and is grabbing hold of the, of the tradition in a way that it never has before. So all of that to say is I'm going to post ecumenical type of content and just because I am, it doesn't mean I'm propagating one side or the other. What I'm ultimately hoping we can see is that there is an ecumenical movement within Christianity that's dedicated to apologetic arguments as put forth in Catholic tradition from its conception. And both sides are utilizing this and a prominent figure like Bishop Barron is on board with this as well, and therefore we should be too. About 10 years ago, I was a scholar in residence at the North American College in Rome. I remember one day having a, a long conversation with one of the students who was very interested in evangelization. Now mind you, this is about 2007, so we're right at the height of the new atheist period when you know Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris were you know, very much on the public scene. And I was bemoaning the fact that there were very few Christians who seemed able to stand up to the new atheists, that when they did, it was often a, a pathetic performance, you know? At which point this young man said to me, well, have you heard of William Lane Craig? At the time I had not. And he said, oh gosh, he's the best one at dealing with the new atheists. And he said he's an evangelical Protestant, but he uses a lot of the Catholic philosophical tradition in dealing with the new atheists. So I said, oh wow. So that very night I went on YouTube and I, I found these debates. And, and I became, really from that night on, a fan of William Lane Craig. So that's why just uh, why a few months ago when I was invited by the, uh, the Claremont Center, so over at the uh, Claremont University, for Reason, Religion, and Public Affairs, to spend a day with William Lane Craig, I, um, I jumped at the chance. What they put together was a, uh, a combination of a more academic um, 
segment and then a more popular segment. So in the afternoon, Dr. Craig and I uh, met with about 25 other scholars. We were invited each to give a, about a half hour philosophical paper and then there'd be a response and discussion. So anyway, it was, um, it was a wonderful afternoon. I gave a, a little paper on the divine simplicity, which is kind of a technical point in Catholic theology. It's the claim that in God, essence and existence coincide. So to be God is to be to be. God is his own act of existence. It has all kinds of implications uh, across the board. So I laid it out because I had read that William Lane Craig was an opponent of the idea of the divine simplicity. So uh, he responded to me in, in a way that I kind of expected he would. And it led to, I think, a pretty lively conversation among the Catholic and Protestant scholars around the table. Dr. Craig gave a paper on what's called penal substitution. It's the idea that uh, the cross of Jesus amounts to Jesus taking upon himself the punishment that we deserve for sin. He's innocent, didn't deserve it, but he, out of love, takes on the punishment that was due to us and thereby satisfies the divine uh, justice and liberates us from sin. So again, it's a sort of a technical point in what's called soteriology, or the theory of how we are saved. Um, I responded to him and said that yes, penal substitution can be found in the great tradition, but so can lots of other uh, motifs. And he agrees with that too. He wanted to bring penal substitution to the center. I was urging something more like the Christus Victor theory, and we can talk about that some other day, but it was a very lively discussion. Again, certain fault lines emerged that divide Catholics and Protestants, but it was a good, um, respectful, high-level um, philosophical conversation. Well, then that evening, we gathered in a, a big uh, arena at uh, Claremont. Beautiful campus, by the way. And uh, about 1,200 people came and witnessed the uh, evening live. And I think about 25,000 uh, watched it uh, live stream. Uh, it was a structured conversation between uh, Dr. Craig and me. We did not want it to be a debate. So both of us said that. We don't want this to devolve into a, a debate about 16th century issues dividing Catholics and Protestants. We want it to be much more of an exploration of common ground. Here are two people, one Protestant, one Catholic, who are very much involved in evangelization, apologetics, addressing the new atheism, addressing uh, secularism, and where can we find common ground? I think we did find a lot of common ground. I'll name a couple things. One was we're both opposed to dumbed down presentations of Christianity. Um, this has not served the Christian church as well in any way. Now there's on the Catholic side, you know, reasons I think for a dumbing down in the last maybe 40, 50 years. He explored reasons on the Protestant side, but we agreed this is not the way to go. Especially young people today have a lot of intellectual issues and they respond well to an intellectual discussion of the faith. He mentioned how some people, you know, come to Christ through the ontological argument. So. I know certainly when I was, you know, coming of age and being educated, it was a commonplace thing to say that, oh, well, you know, those are fine, all those little theological and philosophical uh, discussions, but, but no one really comes to faith because of that. Nonsense. And I can witness that too. Nonsense. They do. They are effective. So stop dumbing down Christianity. <laughs> so we, we agreed on that. Um, you know, a second theme that we, we found a lot of common ground was an opposition to scientism. So I know I've talked about it before, but it's rampant today, rampant among young people. The reduction of all knowledge to the scientific form of knowledge. It's only when you speak scientifically are you speaking truthfully or meaningfully. And as Craig and I both pointed out, scientism suffers from a, a fundamental inconsistency. Because the one thing you can't determine on purely scientific grounds is that only scientific truth is, is legitimate. That's a philosophical position, which is fine. We can debate it philosophically, but don't tell me, therefore, that philosophy is meaningless. When you yourself, qua scientism advocate, are, are taking a philosophical position. Okay, so we both saw the great danger in scientism and the need to oppose it. Uh, for me, one of the best parts of the evening was we had the opportunity to ask each other questions. And um, he asked me about beauty because he no noticed that in my writing that I say we should lead with beauty. And I made my standard argument that in a postmodern um, context, uh, leading with the true and the good is often a non-starter. So just showing people the beauty of the faith 
can be compelling. And uh, I must say, I think he looked at me with, with uh, um, kindness, but also with a certain incomprehension. Like, I, I don't really understand how that would work. And uh, we did a little back and forth, but I thought it was an interesting Catholic-Protestant divide because the Protestant churches did move away from the beautiful as a route of access to God. I think that's fair to say. When the Catholic tradition has always embraced it in our art, architecture, music, poetry, et cetera, et cetera. So that was an interesting moment. Uh, when I was able to ask him a question, I, I said with a, a smile, I, I'd love to ask you basically why you're not Catholic. Uh, but then I said, let me nuance it by saying, asking you, what, what do you like best about Catholicism and what do you like least? And I, you know, I appreciate his honesty. Uh, what do you like least were a lot of the classic 16th century uh, points of demarcation. You know, the, the question of justification, of what salvation means, the role of Mary, the Pope. I mean, a lot of the standard things. What he liked best was this great intellectual tradition that stretches from present day all the way back through the great medieval doctors into the church fathers back to you know, Justin Martyr, and that the Catholic Church has, in a powerful way, preserved and, and celebrated that tradition. So I, I appreciated that very much. Um, I asked him about prayer. How does he pray? And then he asked me the same question, and uh, that, that was interesting to me. He prays largely in a petitionary way, praying for people, um, but also his prayer involved reading slowly, a few pages at a time, the Church Fathers. So I use that as a, a way to a segue to, to my style of prayer, often involving the holy hour in the morning, and it's the Psalms and the office of the church, which involves typically reading from the church fathers as well as the scriptures. Anyway, I thought that was an interesting uh, moment. Uh, You know, bottom line, I thought it was a very hopeful day, ecumenically speaking. I like when when, uh, Christians get together, different denominations, we don't just play nice. And what I mean is, I, I'm all in favor of being nice, you know, but I think there's more to it. There's the real engagement of issues. And we did it that day, uh, pretty deeply in the afternoon, on two central ideas. Who is God? How are we saved? And then the evening, I think we sunk our teeth into some, some real similarities and differences. And I like that in the ecumenical conversation. So anyway, I'm grateful to him and grateful to those that organized it. And I think it's It's grounds for some ecumenical hope.